books in the basement and they brought them up and stacked them on top of each other into the windows and uh, loopholed them as well. You know, they sat there waiting for the British to come. Truthfully, there was only really one attack when the Lancers came trotting down the road on horseback. It was a barrage of fire from here, so intense for the first time in Irish history since 1798, the British Army turned on their heels and ran from the battle. So you can imagine the sense of euphoria, like you'd be turning to your comrades, oh, we're going to beat these guys, look at them running away. But very easily, euphoria can turn into trigger happiness and boredom as well, okay? Are any, any of you ever teachers or anything like that, okay? Or, well, sure, we were all in school, weren't we? Your teacher would never say to you, look after yourselves for an hour, I'm off to the staff room for a smoke and a cup of coffee, because what happens is little Johnny flicks little Mickey in the ear, and then two minutes later, the whole school is on fire. So what they always do is give you something to do. So, like, there was nobody doing nothing. You had loads of work to do. You might be building barricades, or you might be manning the roof, or running messages. And a lot of the women were on the cooking duties and the medical staff and running messages. However, in the social Socialist areas such as City Hall and Stevens Green, the women were physically firing their weapons. Have you ever heard of a woman called Margaret uh, Skinner who left her job as a maths teacher over in Glasgow and with her final check she bought a Lee Enfield rifle and made her way to the most teachers dream about that. It keeps them going. But she made her way over to Belfast and then down to Dublin. And on the morning of the rising, herself and nine other women were supposed to go down to Boland's Mills, but they were to be picked up at a certain spot. And nobody came for them. De Valera didn't want the women. And uh, uh, she went up to Stevens Green instead with the women. And uh, she was wounded three times, uh, firing across at the Shelburne Hotel. And at one stage, she went down to the Russell Hotel and tried to burn out the sniper. And he shot her three times. You know, incredible. And years later, she says to De Valera, how come you left us standing there? Why didn't you bring us down to Boland's Mills? And De Valera says, with, with hindsight, I should have brought all the women because it would have freed up my men from the cooking duties. So you can imagine her reaction to that. Not a happy punter at all, all right? Now, on, um, on uh, reflection, other jobs might include, let's say, uh, uh, you might be um, distributing the proclamation, okay? There's a, there's a wonderful, wonderful document for you to read later on or on the way home on the bus. If you haven't read it this year, I know you've all read it in your lifetime, but uh, it's so beautiful, everybody is included in it. You know, it's the Irish men and Irish women, which is an immediate uh, uh, attraction for 50% of the country, okay? Women didn't have a vote in 1918. Uh, they got the vote, uh, but uh, it was restricted hilariously uh, to 30-year-old women alongside 21-year-old males. I always love the notion that some civil servant decided, yes, yes, a 21-year-old man has the same intellectual capacity and decision-making capabilities as a 30-year-old woman, whereas in all fairness, it's the other way around. It just takes a long time in life to realise that, okay? Oh, 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 I should single out for a special uh, mention a man called Sean T. O'Kelly. Sean T. O'Kelly, Sean T. O'Kelly, who was a future president of Ireland. He was out there with a bundle of proclamations over his arm and he plastering them up all around the place. And he mailed three copies to himself from a faraway post box. One which did arrive because the post was completely discombobulated during the uprising, obviously. One that is now in Doyle Aaron when you walk in the front door, okay? There it is, uh, signed by Sean T. O'Callaghan. Another man from Belfast, Seamus Robinson, was given a, a bunch of proclamations to give out. And Robinson felt that this task was beneath him, you know? He, he's quite self deprecating He's quite down on himself anyway, and uh, he, he grabbed a little newsboy, you know, a new paper boy, and he says, here lad, distribute them around, you know, and he gave him a shilling. And the kid came back three hours later with his hat full to the brim of coins, and he says, have you any more of them proclamation things, mister, like, you know, he didn't even selling them out in the street, so he had, like, you know, brilliant altogether. But um, uh, w w someone did all right anyway, I was like, you know, and on the subject of poverty, okay, and those newsboys were very poor. They, they would live in the tenements, and the tenements were as bad as in Belfast, but there's a big difference between Belfast and Dublin. And that is that there was a, a huge uh, employment possibility in Belfast, at least on the shipyards, okay, and in the linen industry as well. But in Dublin, it, there was very little work except day labouring, you know, import, export, down at the docks, right? And uh, poverty was endemic, uh, 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 to the extent that infant mortality rates were a staggering 142 per thousand births. It's just phenomenal, like, you know, it's three in, in, in our country today, two or three per thousand births, and 142 was, was, was what we were dealing with way back then. For every thousand children born, 142 of them never made their first birthday, you know, just staggering. So this is what James Conley and, and Jim Larkin, the great Labour leaders, were trying to uh, fight against, if you will, okay? And when Patrick Pierce walked out there, uh, 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 where the statue of Cúhullin is, and read the proclamation, uh, most people just kind of ignored him, right? It wasn't like the great momentous occasion where he gave the great oration at the funeral of Jeremiah O'Donovan Rossa, where he says, you know, the fools, the fools, the fools, they have left us our Fenian dead, and while Ireland holds these graves, Ireland unfree shall never be at peace. Okay? Now, 
Monday and Tuesday, a lot of looting and burning went on. Looting, looting, you know, understandable because the poverty, kicking in windows, grabbing bits and bobs, like, you know, there is a, a joke for years, like a little kid running down the street with a pile of boots and shoes, women's and men's, piled up for the whole family, and he no shoes on his feet, and he bumped into a priest, and the priest says to him, young man, where did you get those boots? He says, around in Tyler's father, but you better hurry, they're nearly all gone, you know. <laughs> so there's, 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 there's the notion being that everybody was at it, okay? Uh, but um, the problem with the looters is that they're also setting fire to the buildings, and the intensity of the heat was pretty unbearable. Uh, uh, one lad described the heat as not being a, you couldn't lean against the wall of the post office because you'd leave your hand behind. Others describe molten rivers of glass snaking their way through the cobblestone streets, and more describe 150 foot flames higher than Nelson's pillar. So very, very um, uh, scary altogether, you know. On Thursday, James Connolly was outside on Prince's Street, and this is Connolly out at the firing line, you know, and that's why I love him, like, you know, like, he's a general from World War One. many generals in World War One were anywhere near the blooming front line, you know, did, did any general run over the, the, the top in the Somme, like, you know, of course they didn't, they were all 20 miles behind the front line, you know, well, I know there's people say, well, you, you know, you're general, you don't want them to die, but Connolly is out there encouraging them, and he took a shot in the shoulder, went back out again, took a very nasty wound in the ankle, and any soldier will tell you, worst place to be shot, very debilitating altogether, but he's lying in a bed, uh, somewhere here, who knows, uh, we don't have the exact position, but he's given an orders. You do this, you do the other, keeping the morale alive, right? Now, Pierce, Patrick Pierce, he's quite an enigma. You know, poet, dreamer, visionary, editor of Clive Soulish, the language newspaper, when he was 23 years of age, you know? Like, incredibly, um, uh, he, 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 he ticked a lot of boxes, if you will, okay? He, he, he studied law as well for four years. He took one court case, lost it, never took another one. Just gave up, you know, moved on. Became an educator as well, called the English Educational System, the murder machine, designed to murder the intellect, murder the sense of identity, and murder the sense of the individual as well. You know, he's kind of like the Irish Maria Montessori, very, very Catholic as well, you know, very much into the whole idea about his blood will spill and make a rose tree, that sort of stuff, okay? And he's wandering around to all that. Ah, don't be worrying now, you'll be meeting our maker soon enough. Like, that's the last thing you want to hear in the middle of a battle. You want to hear someone saying, I'm going to get you out of here alive. And here's yeah. where Michael Joseph O'Ratley comes in. Do you remember O'Ratley? I know I banged a lot of names at you already, right? Sorry about that. But O'Ratley is the guy who drove around Ireland stopping the uprising. He drove down to Kerry and Cork and what have you. Well, he joined in anyway when he saw the guys had gathered at Liberty Hall. For years, uh, people t thought he said what was said in the Yates poem. Yates wrote a poem about him. And he says O'Ratley jumped out of his car and says, because I helped to wind this clock, I've come to hear it strike. Okay, now that's beautiful. If he did say that, that's pretty good. I, I think he says, "I'll help you out, lads." That's what he probably says. Okay, I don't think anyone walked around talking like William Shakespeare. But um, he, 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 he got thirty fellas to line up down on Moor Street, and the plan was. We'll bail down Moore Street, break our way through the British barricade, make our way to Williams and Woods Jam Factory, and that will be our new headquarters. So it's a sound plan. But the problem is, at the end of Moore Street, uh, there's a machine gun, possibly two machine guns, possibly two, but certainly um, a, a lot of snipers as well. And O'Reilly was approached by a man called Desmond Fitzgerald. Now, Des Fitzgerald uh, was the quartermaster here, and he wrote a book about this called Desmond's Rising. It's a very good book. You know, he talks about how they raided the hotel for food and how the manager was going crazy with them and how he wrote them a little receipt for all the food, you know. He's a, his son is Gareth Fitzgerald, you know, the Taoiseach in the 1980s. <coughs> I wouldn't be <coughs> keen on his political party. However, uh, I admire any man who spent three hours in a room with Margaret Thatcher on his own, like fair play to him for that, like, you know, he deserves our, our, our commendation for that alone. Well, well, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, Desmond says in his book that he said to O'Reilly just before the charge, he says, best of luck, Michael, I'll see you later. He says, Desmond, I'll never see you again. You know, you're a good friend. Isn't that incredible, right? And he blew his whistle and he even had a little joke. Irish speakers to the rear, English speakers to the fore, you know. Uh, he's a great man for the Grail guy. And uh, they charged down the street. Machine gun went into overdrive, a Lewis gun, and uh, um, Patrick Shortus, a, man, a Kerry man, his, his, a fellow Kerry man, uh, was killed immediately. O'Ratley kept on running, bullets whizzing into his body, taking lumps out of him, right? The adrenaline kept him going. He ran into a little doorway, heard the British were going, there's one to the right, there's one to the right. And he said, Jesus, I'm a goner now. And he, 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 he dashed down a little laneway, and he shot at again, right? And the, the, the dying moments, his dying moments, he took a, a, a second to write a little note to his wife, with a pencil, Yates said he writ in his own blood, okay? He, his lovely letter is still around. It's a plaque there as well. He says, darling Nancy, I've just been shot leading a rush up Murray Street. I took 
more than one bullet, I think. Tons and tons of love, dearie, to you and to Nell and to the boys and to Anna. It was a good fight, anyhow. Lovingly yours, O'Rattley. And he says, please deliver this to Nanny O'Rattley, 40 Herbert Park, Dublin. Goodbye, darling, okay? And he put it in his pocket. Now, a British soldier, a kind British soldier, who was carrying bodies into the ambulance, found O'Ratley's body and didn't do what he should have done, which is give that letter to his superior officer. That letter went into his pocket and a few uh, days later, nearly a week later, he delivered that, I reckon, on his own time. Because Nanny O'Ratley says, your man was in a bit of a rush, like the British soldier. And think about this, it's always an officer who delivers those kind of things, right? And this is a private in the British Army, runs up the door, very posh house, you know, very rich to wear, bangs on the door, gives the woman the letter and ran away, like, you know. And I always think it'd be lovely if we found that British soldier's relationship now like if some you know I always wait some time on a tour a fella say yeah my granddad delivered a letter to some woman you know it'd be great to put the two families together that would be a real circular sort of a, a handshake you know what I mean like you know but um, we like that line it was a good fight anyhow because you don't have to be the winner to be the victor and we're Irish so we all know that anyway okay because we never bloody win anything anyway all right and here you know like I read an article there uh, only a few months ago saying what was the point in the rising when they were going to lose you know, that's nuts, right? That, it, it, Northern Ireland or Ireland uh, uh, going off the Republic, going off to what you call it, the Euros. Okay? I'm not really into football, all right? But <coughs> Jesus, like, do any of us think we're going to win? No, but you don't go, oh, there's no point in us going, lads, you know. You, you go anyway. You take part. You give it a shot. Patrick Pierce said, we have fought. We have won. We have won because we have fought. You know, that's the thing. Look, you know, beautiful, isn't it? Like, okay, listen, right, we're going to go down the road now and we're going to fantastic exhibition on 1916. There's books, art, um, there's fellas with collections of the most wonderful stuff that they've all put together. A few lads in uniform and stuff like that. So there's medals and weapons and all that kind of stuff. And it's free in and you can wander around at your leisure, even if you go in for two minutes or, or two hours. Entirely up yourself, okay? City Hall was occupied in 16, so it's pretty brilliant that it's there today. And again, I remind you of the anniversary as well. And I'm not trying to shamelessly promote my own book, but I have three books that I've written and they are in for sale there as well. I'm just saying, my wife and child are in there selling them. And here goes the bloody game. But um, uh, yeah, I've got, I've got one on James Connolly, one on uh, the Rising, a small one for a tenor. And I've got a, a nice hardback one on the Rising as well that sold very well. It's like lists of everybody who was involved, lists of the weapons, that kind of stuff, the women, the 276 women. So they're in there anyway, if you want. Just one thing, Dublin Castle, right on the doorstep, uh, City Hall right on the doorstep. There's the most lovely statue in the world up there of Justice. And Justice was designed by Van Nost, a Dutch artist, in the 1770s, 1773, I think, when it was unveiled. And uh, he, 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 he'd lived here for a while, and he had a comment on British justice in Ireland. So he had, first of all, the statue is facing away from the people. She's got her back toward. Secondly, she's holding the scales of justice with such a disdain that you only reserve to pick up your husband's underpants from the bathroom floor <laughs> and dump outside every morning. And also, she's not blindfolded. Justice should be blind to race and creed and uh, gender. And there's now a poem about her. The Statue of Justice, Mark Wellhorse Station. Her face to the castle and her arse to the nation. And there'll be no justice would ever come from there, okay? Look it, I'm gonna wind up, all right? Thanks very much, Roy. I've had a very pleasurable tour, which I have to say, you're very uh, easygoing people. I hope you enjoyed yourself. I hope you'll help spread the word a little bit. Thank you very much. And I have a little drink for you as well, if you want. It's a little flyer for the tour, if you want to come down. And, and, the, and, the, and the bill, Lord, no. And the bill, is, I have a bill. Oh, Jesus, yeah, I have a bill. Yeah, I'll give you them and you can pass them on. And uh, yeah, thanks very much to your committee and to Wilbert as well for our uh, bill here. Now. I know, right? Everybody yes, else. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, here, come on in. If you're looking for my books, they're just in there to the right a little bit. I'll be there, you'll see me in a second. All right, so I won't say goodbye because uh, well, I will say goodbye. But uh, come in and say hello to this has been sponsored by the council. And we also are pleased to say we've got some money left, which we're going to bring you all down on the 17th of September to the Points of House Culture Night, it's something I'm involved with. So this, and I invite you down to Calton Bay as well for something to eat before you go down and get a coach as well. But please, uh, 
Please come to that. I think it's so important. It's part of the it's part of the program for which we for which we applied uh, for funding. And that's on the seventeenth of September. It's a Friday night. Okay, seventeenth. So I've got all your details. I've got all your details. And can I say thanks very much to Claire because Claire is the worker. I just do the talking. <laughs> and I'm from Alpha Bay. Claire, as you know, from Kenny Day. And we we'll work. Claire comes down to work with us evening. He goes to work at the on the writing seat, and we've built up this relationship in terms of working together for the good of the community in general, and obviously in particular in terms of cross-community work. So thank you very much for making sure you appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. The other side, the, the, the unfortunate part of today is that we're going to charge you a favour. Sarah's <laughs> 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 going to do the dirty work and, and collect the favours. I think you're all this morning. I do hope you've enjoyed yourself. Also, John had a wee a thing going around there, I think he gave most of it to cancer research, a barbecue in Alton Bay next Saturday uh, oh, night. So if you haven't got one of those, uh, John had them, but you had them, John. You had them. Yeah. So you have to please, please, uh, please support that as for cancer. Thank you all very much, and I'd also like you to show your appreciation for A, an excellent coach, and also an excellent coach driver. Thank you.